Uh, welcome everybody to another episode of IntentWise Connect uh, webinars. I am Srinath Reddy, the host today. Um, if you don't, if you're not already aware of what IntentWise does, uh, just a quick brief. IntentWise is a software company, and we primarily have two solutions. One is a full-blown ad management platform for Amazon, Walmart, Instacart, Credio, uh, which also includes some content capabilities. <laughs> Uh, and the other is a uh, data infrastructure solution, which is designed to uh, really uh, automate the collection, ownership, reporting, and analytics on all the critical Amazon data you have, which tends to be pretty fragmented. And some of the data sources we integrate with are the basic ones you can think of, sponsored ads, DSP, Seller Central, Vendor Central. But some of the more advanced ones include Amazon Marketing Cloud, Amazon Marketing Stream, and the solution is called IntentWise Analytics Cloud. Right, so that's what Intervise does. Logistics for today's session, Brent is going to walk us through a presentation, which I'm super excited about and learn from. Um, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, and by the way, whether it's now or during the presentation, there is a Q&A option in the Zoom window. Uh, please feel free to um, share questions, ask questions. We'll try to address all of them at the end of the uh, end of the recording. And then, um, on the recording, yes, we will share out the Zoom recording uh, with everybody. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so there was a question in the chat about that. So uh, Jennifer, yes, we'll get you the recording. Uh, so that's on logistics. And uh, with all these types of sessions, uh, hopefully there's no technical glitch, but if there is, just be patient, we'll recover. <laughs> uh, just hang tight. And then, uh, so let's dive into today's topic. You know, I think it is uh, at this point a very common understanding that quality of content has a huge bearing on how a brand does on Amazon or any marketplace for that matter. And today I am really excited to be hosting Brent Zarednik. He is the founder of a rapidly growing full service Amazon agency called AMZ Pathfinder. Him, his team, him and his team have been helping a number of brands uh, with uh, with content optimization. So <clears throat> really excited to hear from practitioner, from a practitioner. And he's going to share with us uh, best practices, learnings, and also answer some tough questions. Right, Brent? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> best I can. Best I can. <laughs> Welcome all challengers. Um, yeah. So, Brent, good to have you. Um, and then let's uh, let's dive in. Why don't you take a moment, introduce yourself, and then again, I know I know you're going to share a presentation, and sure. we, we, we'll we'll jump right in. Yeah, I'll do a screen share and get into it in a second. Uh, but yeah, like you said, uh, Amazon Pathfinder company I founded in mid 2015. Now we've been around for quite a while, uh, and been, we're doing mostly ad services for all those years. But more recently, have um, kind of expanded into creative services and. Uh, you know, I'm someone who comes from an advertising background, and that's kind of my original passion, but I've actually really got into this um, storefront listing optimization stuff in just the past, I would say, four or five months uh, as the team has really started to ramp it up. And I'm really proud of the work they've done. Uh, big shout out to Elena on my team who helped me put a lot of this presentation together because she is our internal expert. So I want to recognize her and her hard work right up front. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll get into it. Let me uh, go ahead and share screen. So yeah, today... Uh, creating Amazon listings and storefronts that convert. Uh, who am I? Work with PPC since 2012, founded Pathfinder in 2015. We are a team of 22 people now, mostly based in uh, the EU. We've got a couple people in Asia, a couple people in Central America. Uh, I personally live in France, and besides doing all this nerdy stuff, I'm really into cycling. I usually look like that in the photo, not like you see me here. I usually have a helmet, glasses, <laughs> and I'm on a bike. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Now, what's the agenda? Uh, there's kind of four major sections today. Why bother with optimization? How to think about optimization? How to do optimization? And then measuring results. So kind of the main idea behind the webinar today is contextualizing listing optimization as part of the bigger picture in 2023 and how to get it done right. So first thing, why bother with optimization? Uh, you know, I'm an ads guy, so why am I talking about listings and storefronts and optimization? Aren't those two things kind of separate? Well, the way I see it, it's all part of the conversion chain. So this is uh, what takes a shopper from search and discovery to ad cart, 
uh, to purchase, right? Each link in that chain has to be as strong as possible to ensure that uh, a purchase occurs. And that's what you want if you're a seller. So advertising is only one of those links actually. And it's upstream from the conversion side, which is downstream and uh, a link further in the chain. Um, so any chain uh, that has a weak link is going to break. <laughs> so when we're talking about optimizing as an ad agency, the way we think about it is we wanna strengthen that chain. Um, and you know, a listing is, a, is an asset. If the uh, last couple of years of aggregators have really taught us anything, if you have a high converting quality listing on Amazon and storefront for that matter, that is something that uh, is an asset. You can sell that, right? So it's worthwhile investing time, energy, money, uh, you know, sweat, blood and tears into building assets. Uh, but it is like a garden. It requires regular care, feeding and maintenance. So that's kind of what we're talking about today. Uh, a couple other things, you know, efficiency of ads is increased with conversion rate. Even if you increase half a percentage point, your ads are going to do better. Um, high conversion rates in general is kind of like a reliability credibility signal to Amazon. And it leads to what I call like rank persistence, right? So you can rank really well for something if you pour a bunch of money into it with ads. But as soon as you turn the faucet off, uh, unless it has a good conversion rate, it's not going to actually stay ranking on Amazon's ecosystem. And uh, yeah, the last thing is that Amazon listings and storefronts are not set it and forget it. And I threw this meme in here because I love this meme. Anyone who sells on Amazon knows that this is 100% not the case. <laughs> but many of the gurus online will have you believe passive income, Amazon only goes up, set a listing and forget it. Uh, it's actually not like that at all. So yeah. Uh, next thing, why bother optimizing? Yet again, these KPIs are what's going to improve. Conversion rate up, dependency on ads down, overall sales up. ACOS down. Tacos, I put a stop sign. Tacos means total advertising cost to sale, generally speaking. You want to get it under control. It doesn't go up or down. You want it under control. Um, cost per click down. Sessions up. So unique visitors up. So when optimization is done right, these are the things that improve, right? That's what we're going for here. Now, how to think about optimization. Now that we understand why it's so darn important, how do we actually think about it? It is two parts. It's both art and science. So allow me to get a little bit philosophical here for a second. Um, on the art side, the questions we want to ask are, um, who are we selling to? What problems are we solving for them? What drives them? How do we speak in their language and use words that they understand? So that's the art side. We're getting inside that shopper's mind. We're empathizing with them. The second part is the science side, and that's like, what is the right mixture of tools that we can use to confirm our hypothesis about what kind of content is going to resonate with shoppers and help us build something that's suitable for machines and by machines i mean amazon's a9 uh, search algorithms uh, indexing and categorization these types of things we always hear about in the amazon world uh, in general i would argue that amazon is more heavily weighted towards the science side but the art side is super important and actually, when you're doing content optimization, it's a balance of talking to the humans and the computers both. Because uh, if you do one too far in one direction, it's going to be useless for the other side, and that's not going to help you. So art and science. Now, uh, how to actually do content optimization. This is probably what most of you are here for, I would imagine, <laughs> instead of the philosophical stuff. So we've set the context. Uh, how do we actually do it? So these are the steps that we've kind of identified at Pathfinder. Um, there's five of them. Maybe I should have given them a number, uh, but here we are. Identify target listings or storefronts. Examine relevant competitors. Gather your data. Number three, make optimizations based on your hypotheses you've come up with. Uh, four, monitor results for impact and run A-B tests or run A-B tests. We'll get to that. And then adjust as required and repeat the cycle. Hit the repeat button on that and do it again. Um, that kind of constant iteration is what leads to really good product listings over time. So first thing, identify target listings. And uh, this might look familiar to some of you, especially those of you from <laughs> IntentWise, but this is something called content analytics. This is a module inside of IntentWise that basically allows us to scan and prioritize an entire catalog really fast. So what we do is uh, we run this against, you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of uh, SKUs, ASINs uh, in a client catalog. And then it will bring up pretty quickly what we need to look at in order to um, 
start looking for like problem areas, basically. What is below benchmark, as the tool usually says? Uh, the only downside to this is you need to be connected and using intent-wise, which all of our current clients are, so that's no problem for us. Um, and if we're doing an audit, you have to do it a little bit differently. But if you're not connected to intent-wise, I don't know what you're doing. You got to go sign up for that right away, and you got to get and you got to get into this <laughs> because this is actually a really great module. This is only one little dashboard from it. This isn't the whole thing, and you can export this. You can set a schedule so it runs weekly, monthly, whatever, um, and it comes with all the nice, pretty graphs that we know and love. This is one way to do it. Another way to do it: How do you identify your listings? Uh, quite simple. Just use some logic, right? Top sellers that's the most urgent ones. If you have a top seller that is looking a little bit rough around the edges, you should probably address that. Uh, how we do it, at least, feedback from clients. So a client will say, hey, I feel like this listing is not the way it should be. Uh, in this case, that's you, the audience. So you know, I call this the you know what listing needs help metric <laughs> because you probably do. Um, another thing we do with advertising is the account managers themselves will flag up listings that are low conversion rate and say, hey, client or hey, communications team or hey, Brent, um, this listing is really resistant to advertising. It's not working. We need to do something about this. This is actually the reason that we started doing this as a service. Um, and then the last part is just data. You know, look at your business reports to see your unit session percentage and see which one is low. Like I put a little screenshot on the right side here. So obviously whatever product has that 1.87, um, these are high price products for the account that I took this from, but you know, that 1.87, maybe we could get that up to a 2.5, or maybe for really ambitious, we can get it to a four and a half, like some of those other products that are in the same catalog. Um, so that just stands out like a red thumb. Sorry, sore thumb. Uh, and then we're talking about storefronts in this presentation too, so don't forget those. And what do you, how, how do you determine if a storefront needs optimization? Well, it's out of sync with the current season. So we just had Christmas like a month ago, uh, but we're coming into like the Easter season now. So storefronts should no longer be featuring like Santa and elves and snow or whatever you might put in a storefront, but um, I don't know rabbits and uh, Easter eggs and stuff like that, to use a really simple example. Don't forget that you can do versioning with storefronts. So you can actually queue up uh, several versions of a storefront, and then you can actually have it you know, staggered to launch uh, later in the year uh, and make that the one that's now featured, appropriate with the season. Um, if you have poor results, using it as a landing page from your sponsor brands or sponsor display campaigns, that's usually a good sign. If the design is lacking in new features, like video is great, you should have lots of video. Uh, what we call shoppable images, which are essentially images that you can click and it brings up the product listing, you can add to cart right from inside the storefront. Or uh, if you look at some of the pages in what's called store page insights or storefront insights, which is basically the analytics, and it says, oh, this page has low conversion rate compared to the other pages. Um, that is another like red flag you should look at. So step two then, examine relevant competitors and gather data. And just like a warning here, a heads up, this is a very manual process. Uh, a lot of the stuff that's required in like true uh, listing optimization is time consuming. And um, unless you really like spreadsheets, and I mean, a lot of people on my team do, I don't mind them. It's not exactly for everybody. <laughs> Tools will certainly help you speed it up. Um, and we use Helium 10 for a lot of these, which is a well-known tool. But really, there's a lot of tools out there you could use. So it's not super important, like which individual tool you use. Just know that there's a bunch out there. And uh, yeah, what we do is basically do reverse ASINs on our product. Uh, several top competitors that we've identified uh, as like what's called aspirational products that we want to rank like, we want to sell like. Uh, we look at the reviews uh, pretty heavily, actually with uh, Review Insights, which is a tool that's kind of built into Helium 10 as well. We scan them manually. Uh, we spend time in spreadsheets noting down things. Um, and then we look at the search term data from advertising too, uh, which is like kind of a window into, I would say shopper psychology and like a direct line into like what people are searching for recently. Um, so we have plenty of ad data, so no, no trouble there. Um, this is what this actually looks like in implementation. We have a lot of spreadsheets that look basically like this. So keyword phrases, and then these are all competitors, columns D through K there at the top. And then it's showing rank for those particular terms. We've highlighted the ones green that are like really relevant. We have search volume. So we're getting a good sense of what the keyword landscape looks like for this product or this product and its child variations. Um, and this is just a nice screenshot from 
Helium 10, I mean, a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but they have a review analysis um, and like review uh, insights tool, which is really cool. You can download the reviews and then look through them yourself. You can look at all the questions people are asking. Uh, you can look through, uh, my favorite part here is the review analysis. So it shows you like word frequency. This is like some um, finger tape, uh, just a random example I found. Uh, but basically, apparently it's used a lot for jujitsu. I mean, we have BJJ, we have jujitsu. Yeah, you see it multiple times. So just looking at this, I don't know anything about this tape. I, I can say that people are probably safely using this for Brazilian jujitsu. And apparently it works great as well. <laughs> so these are some of the things that we would aggregate, download and incorporate into a series of spreadsheets that would allow us to have a base understanding of like how our product is positioned against competitors and what people are um, you know, raving about, or in some cases with reviews, like really being quite negative on, right? We want to address both those things. Okay, now we've set that. Number three, making optimizations. Um, yeah, this is an interesting thing. Uh, I'm not sure if this is common knowledge, but anyone who's ever done some serious um, Amazon optimizations familiar with this, this is called the category style guide. And every category on Amazon has a style guide. This is a document that's actually from Amazon. You can find it if you just Google around. And this one is for home garden and pets. It's just the first one I found when I Googled around. And this thing is tw uh, 23 pages, but it's really like a resource you're supposed to skim through. It's not like a book you're gonna read like front to back. Um, and it basically goes into what it says, uh, style guides. So like, for instance, how long of a title can you make in home garden and pets? Well, I could find out by reading this. Um, some categories have an 80 character limit, some have 200, some have 250. It really depends. Uh, you want to understand what category and subcategory you're in, read the style guide and make sure you adhere to it. Um, sometimes they're a little bit outdated, but if you go with this advice, and they actually give some pretty solid advice for uh, what a bullet point should look like, like a good one. Um, so Amazon themselves is telling you, hey, do this, you're going to have more success. So page through this, it's definitely worth it. There's something else called a browse tree guide, which is another similar um, thing you can download direct from Amazon. And that basically shows you where your product can be categorized inside of the, uh, you know, node and sub node structure. So it's like home garden and pets, um, I don't know, gardening supplies, um, handheld tools, and then like a garden rake or something like that. So there's several tiers to help organize. Um, that, that matters a lot for things like indexation and advertising. So like, please pay attention to these things. and. Don't do the black hat thing of trying to list your product in a category <laughs> where it's a lot slower moving products to get the bestseller badge. Don't do that. So title, um, this is a big one. Uh, basically you wanna place the main keywords or the brand at the start. Um, the big debate here is if I have a brand that not many people know, should I put it at the start of the title? Um, that's really up to you. Uh, you can message Amazon and like ask about this too, because uh, you know, some of us listening to this, some of us on the webinar probably have brands that are might be might be well known to certain like sub niches online. But I think most Amazon brands that are Amazon native haven't built that kind of brand awareness net. You're you're not Adidas, right? You're not uh, Nike, not yet. Um, so having that in your first uh, word of your title is not actually helping you. Uh, placing high priority important keywords and key terms and key phrases is helping you. Um, Consider also that the product title is very heavily weighted from like an Amazon SEO perspective. So having the most important keywords in there um, is really is really gonna help you out. Um, basically use all the available characters. We just talked about the uh, style guide. That'll tell you how many you can use. You wanna put in the main purpose of the product, use cases, benefits, uh, specifics like pack count, uh, quantity, um, I don't know, like uh, it's five grams or 52 servings, like these kind of things. So people can scan that title immediately and know it's what they're looking for. Oh, I wanted something that'll last me two months. This is a two month supply. Great, wonderful, I'll take that. Um, and then yet again, circle back to this like competitor data. We wanna rely on that. So rely on the competitor data that you've gathered. Uh, avoid these things, don't use all caps, don't put emojis in there, don't stuff the keywords. Don't put strange characters. I think ampersands in particular, Amazon hates those for some reason. They don't want you to put them in there. And avoid short and boring titles that have like no descriptions. So here's a good one. Yet again, random uh, product I just picked. I really like the name of this brand, Jacked Factory. 
just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> it makes, makes me feel strong already. Uh, but this is like creatine, you know, one of the most common like supplements people take for, uh, you know, muscle growth and stuff. So this is a solid title, right? We have keywords and key phrases all throughout the thing. Provides the amount and the serving. So like there, it's five grams, 85 servings. Perfect. If I was looking for that, I know what I, I, know what I want now. Um, it has the flavor, which is apparently unflavored. Uh, it tells me the benefits, build muscle, increase strength, muscle growth and recovery. And there's no funny business with characters or any kind of like buy now or like uh, super number one voted on Amazon. None of that stuff. Um, so this is like great title. Okay, so title, let's move to images. We're moving quick here, guys. <laughs> so shoppers cannot see the product in person. This is the most important thing to understand about imagery and video on Amazon. Uh, if you're at a Best Buy or uh, here in France, we have a store called Fennec, which is basically like electronic store. I go there occasionally. I see the mouse. I see the keyboard. I pick it up. I look at it. I can't do that on Amazon, right? So shoppers cannot see the product. You have to try to give them that experience if you can. Uh, furthermore, these first impressions really, really, really count. And humans were very visual creatures. We look at something um, on a storeroom floor or on Amazon and our first impressions are really quite strong and subconscious. So you have like half a second to really impress people with images. And then if they're you know enticed, they're going to continue scrolling through the rest of them, right? So think of it this way. You're trying to earn trust and you're trying to make them feel as if they're in uh, in person with the product, right? So high quality images and 3D renders too. 3D renders are cool. Um, we'll earn a lot of trust. While low quality images and stuff that's like obviously crap Photoshop jobs uh, is not gonna help you out. Those things are gonna do the opposite. They're gonna make you like lose trust. So um, another thing, infographics, lifestyle images, and things that are full of what I would call like uh, need to know features of the product. The same things that might be in the title, the same things you're probably gonna put in the bullet points. Those are repeated in the images and conveyed in a visual manner that's very easy for people to grip like really fast, right? So um, you wanna highlight the top use cases too, like show people using it, address pain points from competitor reviews that you read and we um, you know, made a list of earlier and like slide 10, a couple slides ago. And uh, yeah, images are even more important on mobile and we'll see that here in a photo. So when we do image stuff, it, it looks like this. Obviously the, uh, the specifics are blurred to protect the innocent here, but this is for a um, uh, uh, child, child products underneath a parent product. And so we're actually mapping out like photos one through seven. Uh, which one is this? Which one does that look like? Is this an infographic? Here's the creative from the client. Here's our edit, all this kind of stuff. A lot of, um, a lot of spreadsheets yet again <laughs> for doing this kind of work. And you should probably end up with a spreadsheet that looks kind of similar to this when you're doing this editing. Just an easy way to structure the data and understand how your product layout is gonna be. And here are some examples. This is actually that same one. We're, we're back to Jacked Factory here. Super professional looking photo. Uh, it's like in use, right? Somebody is using that. And then here we have benefits. Supports muscle growth, helps boost strength, improves muscle recovery. Guess what? Those are the same things we read in the title earlier, isn't it? Wow, pretty funny how that works out. Uh, here's a totally different product. Um, I like matcha a lot, so I just use it as an example in these kind of presentations. This is like a recipe. This, this is an image from the listing, but it's actually giving me a use case that I can imagine myself doing as a consumer, right? This is a common use case for this product. It, it's possible that the people who made this actually looked through the reviews, talked to their customers, and determined, oh, wow, people are making a lot of matcha lattes with this. Well, guess what? There's a whole image <laughs> describing exactly how to make one. And so this makes me think, oh, look, I got the ingredients. I got the steps. Step four is enjoy. I can imagine myself enjoying that. Um, sounds great. Same thing with this. This is a lifestyle image. You know, no instructions here, but it, it sets the scene, right? So uh, I can almost taste that drink, right? Looks good. Um, I'm imagining myself enjoying it in my perfect spotless kitchen that doesn't have any dishes in the sink or anything like that. Because <laughs> um, that's what that place looks like wherever they are there, the imaginary dream kitchen. <laughs> And the last point here, this is just a photo I took on my phone a couple of days ago, but, um, you know, searching the French Amazon store, I found like some protein and took a, a picture of this. Look how much the image takes up of the real estate. And this is on an iPhone 13. So that's like a larger, you know, larger screen, but all I can really see is title and image. That's it. I have to scroll down to see other stuff, which is like, um, you know, uh, flavors there. And then later on, I'll get to like A plus imagery and stuff like that. But that's all I see on mobile. Images are super important on mobile. So don't do this. <laughs> I 
Um, some of you might be uh, Fallout, Fallout fans in the audience. I, I found this somewhere and I thought this was hilarious. But basically, someone did a Photoshop job here and it really doesn't inspire any confidence. If I look at this, I think I do not want to buy that because I don't want my arms to grow another additional foot. Um, pretty scary. <laughs> so compare those last three or four images we just looked at to this atrocity and you know, say to yourself, when I buy something like this, does this inspire a sense of trust in me? Do I feel like this company is like reputable? Uh, the answer is of course, no. So don't, don't do that. Okay, bullet points. So bullet points, you know, not as important as images and title in my opinion, but the, some of the same principles still apply here. This goes back to the idea of like speaking in the customer's language, using words that they would use that we discussed earlier. And we're just using those same keywords again. So 10 to 20 highly relevant keywords, work them in naturally, set them into key phrases, let's call it. Uh, address the pain points your competitors um, are, are, let's say like raising, if, if you look at their listings and the benefits of your product, how they address those pain points. If you have any negative reviews, try to use the bullet points to head those off and say like, um, you know, we're going to we're going to take that negative review and like positively position it or say like uh, it's been improved or um, I don't have a super good example. But if you try to address any of those reviews, you might be able to head off the shopper before they actually scroll down and see the review. And then it leaves a bad impression on them. They're like, well, I just read in the bullet points that they fixed that problem or now they have a new formula or um, there's actually a different way to think about it than now they've presented to me. And uh, yeah, back to this idea of an avatar, choose one customer avatar and stick with it when you are uh, going through and making bullet points. Um, just thought a small thing about bullet points. I actually couldn't find uh, the definitive answer to this because I'm on this journey of exploration with the rest of you. Uh, but it used to be like five bullet points was like the maximum you had, right? Uh, now, when I go into uh, listing backends, I talk to some of my team, they say it depends on the categories, but you can just like, keep adding bullet points in some cases. Um, I think it's up to 10, uh, but it seems to be somewhat flexible these days. I, I still think like five is kind of the classic and that probably displays on mobile and everything fine, but it appears as though if you want to, you can keep adding them. And I think that Amazon recommends in the style guide, you know, maybe 250 characters per bullet point, which is a thousand. Um, well, that's, it's 200, I guess, if you have five, but uh, yeah. So, so like try to, try to read the style guide and be aware of that when you're going through. Now, this is a good example of bullet points. I'm not going to sit here and read all this, of course, but this is from like a, um, a dermaplaning razor thing. Uh, that's like a beauty product. Um, we'll see it later in some examples, but this is good because it dives into the customer journey of using the product, right? So the first part is talking about the handle is easy to use. The second part is saying, oh, the blades are replaceable. Um, and then the last part is saying it's a, you know, a good skincare tool that's like soft compared to competitors. And the last part is like benefit related, right? It's an improvement to your beauty routine and personal care routine. So it really takes you through and look at all the great keywords that are put in there appropriately, uh, you know, capitalized for both visual appeal and for proper nouns. It's just really well put together and it uses the maximum amount of characters there. So storefront optimization, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we're going to actually head into the uh, A plus and like description part. Hit a, hit a few more things. So storefront optimization, um, to shift into this, you wanna categorize your product families into main pages to make the experience more user-friendly. And by main page, I mean, think of yourself using a website and there's like nav in the top. That's pretty much what you want a store page to look like. This also makes a good landing page. Um, identify which of your pages have good performance and which don't. You can do that through the storefront insights like I talked about earlier. And basically try to replicate the success of the ones that have great performance uh, and make the ones that have crap performance better by replicating it on, on the good ones. Uh, and use the same image. This one came from someone on the ad team the other day, but use the same image in your sponsored brands or sponsored video um, like uh, ads that they see on the landing page when they actually arrive at the storefront. So that way there's like synchronicity between them and apparently it will help you with conversion rate according to some data that we have. Uh, this is what I wanted to show off. I'm a big fan of Gatorade as like a drink. Um, I used to play a lot of uh, soccer or, you know, football, I guess we call it in here in France, but I drank Gatorade all the time and I still like the brand a lot and they have a great page. Um, yeah, they have super clear uh, top level navigation there. You see lots of sweaty athletes drinking the product. I mean, that, that tells you exactly what you're supposed to do with it, right? Um, 
And it has new from Gatorade, hydration, protein, equipment. Their font is like everywhere. The visual identity is super clear. And if I were to set up an ad campaign and I wanted to go to like protein, well, I would know exactly where to do it as the advertiser. I would click on protein there. I'd find the product. I'd find the page. That would be my destination, my landing page for a campaign going from there. Okay, now I lump A plus content and descriptions together because I think that um, A plus content, which is now available to I think everybody, I don't, I don't think there's anyone who's like restricted from having it now. Um, there's A plus plus content, which is a different discussion we won't be going over, uh, but that's like the same thing as a product description, right? So A plus content is essentially a visual storytelling brand building exercise that is there for you to uh, basically describe more of the features and benefits in greater detail. And there's opportunities uh, to include keywords and images with alt text that include those keywords. So actually, if you, um, you know, alt text is usually there for accessibility, right? But you can also put keywords in there too. Um, and those are apparently indexed in the scene by Amazon. This is what I've heard. There is some discussion about if A9 is indexed uh, or not um, uh, by the algorithm. I don't have the definitive answer to that. I've seen evidence that supports either way, but my advice would still be use the keywords like you would anyway. Uh, and A plus content is kind of the purchase decision point for the customer if they're like continuing to scroll, uh, because you will find it between the reviews and after the bullet points, images and title at the top in most cases, right? Um, yeah, so let's actually go to A plus content as an example. Here you go. Uh, this is the one I was talking about earlier, the Derma, uh, derma planning tool. I've never used one of these, but I, I get the idea. This follows like a headline product feature benefit, benefit, benefit layout towards the bottom. So here we have headline, key image, product features right there. And then as we scroll down, we get the key benefits. It even says key benefits. Um, exfoliate, smooth, brighten, soften for all skin types. It's for everybody. Are you ready to elevate your skincare game? I think it's a pretty solid visually consistent a plus and then one thing i actually really like um, i see this a lot on these pages it's a, just a built-in module but it's a product lineup essentially so i can see here these are the other products from stacked and what do they do well some of them treat some of them exfoliate some of them hydrate and this shows off the whole product line and of course a shopper can click or tap on any of these to go to the other ones and uh, add them to their cart too because it you know makes sense if you're interested in that, well, you might be interested in the serum or the face oil, or the needling tool. Oh, okay. This, this one stuck up on me. Sorry, Srinath. <laughs> Could yeah. we run the other poll um, specifically about um, using video on top selling product listings and yes. or on sponsored display or display campaigns? Yeah, sorry. No, no worries. Uh, let me launch the poll. And I video content and launch hopefully uh everyone gets to see it i mean, we just trying to understand like how uh video content has been used by you also i'll share the results in a moment here brent but by far yeah sure the majority is both um with a few, okay. uh, what's interesting is there's a few uh, that use it for neither, <laughs> so which may be something to uh, talk to. But uh, I think uh, yeah. yeah, so I think we have I think we have all the answers. So let me share the poll for a moment. Sure. End okay. Poll. You see it, Brent? I do. Yeah. So the majority, from what I can see here, the percentage-wise is both. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is. Um, which is great. I mean, that's that's pretty much what you should be doing. Um, and then actually the second biggest percentage there was, was neither, neither, which means that yeah. people aren't doing either one of them. I mean, I think if I had to pick one or the other, I would say make a video that's suitable for your product listing and get that up on there first. Um, that's probably uh, that's probably the way to go because you're probably receiving you know, the most traffic to your product listing and that's gonna help boost conversion on that. And then you get some going in advertising that's gonna have a, a, a smaller reach, but you are paying for that reach. So it'll probably help you with the investment. And um, this is a whole other subject, which is ad related, but we haven't really found any consistent type of video to be like the best video ever for ads. Some of them that are like more user generated content, like shot on iPhone, like simple videos will work really well. And then some videos that are like Hollywood quality that our clients have spent thousands of dollars producing with like local video companies in their state or whatever, um, they don't work as well. And sometimes they do. It, it, there's no real 
pattern to it. You just have to test it. <laughs> so another thing to think about. Cool. Um, I think we've been done. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry, I, I clicked and my, my mouse wasn't focused, so it didn't change. So yeah, that leads us into the video discussions. And yeah, I can't resist talking about ads even for 30 minutes when I get on a webinar. So uh, just briefly, I mean, what you want to have in your uh, product listing itself is a lifestyle or, you know, product in use uh, video, I call it, like just showing people, you know, using the product or dogs using the product, if it's a dog toy, if it's a cat toy, whatever. And this should be like one of the last image slots on your listing. I know when I'm a, as a shopper, I watch the videos on listings like uh, immediately. I, I love seeing videos of the thing in someone's hand, like them using it, like the dog using it, whatever. Um, yeah, that, that means a lot to me personally. And I'm not like someone who is like, uh, you know, browsing TikTok and Instagram on videos like all the time. But when I'm shopping on mobile, I really like it. And same thing on desktop. Uh, sponsor brands plus sponsor display. Those have an increasing amount of video creatives like I just talked about. So yeah, you want to get on that and use anywhere from 15 to 25 second long videos for those two ad types. Um, sponsor display in particular has received more and more video ad creative types this year, and Amazon's only going to increase that. They're really shifting into video more and more. And to the last point, Amazon has something they are trying uh, for the second or third time. This time it might stick. It's basically called uh, Amazon Inspire. It's like TikTok for Amazon, <laughs> essentially. So uh, I haven't tried it because I think it's in US limited release only at this time. But uh, you basically can scroll through and like, uh, you know, see user generated content that has uh, shoppable stuff inside of it, like embedded. So they're like serious about video. They have a team at Amazon dedicated to building that app. So they're not messing around. Last thing, and this is a bit of a nerdy one. I have to give credit actually to a guy named Colby Almond. Um, who has a LinkedIn post where he talked about videos showing up on SERP. And so SERP is search engine results page. So people are searching on Amazon, they see the videos. Basically you create a short clip that showcases your product, how to use it, upload it to your catalog, remove all the other videos, wait a little bit, and then re-upload the videos. Because what it's doing is pulling the oldest video apparently, um, and it's supposed to be a seven second clip. This might require some experimentation on your end, um, so yeah, don't, don't hold me accountable if you can't get it to work, but this is like some bleeding edge, interesting stuff. And, um, this link will be obviously in the presentation if so you can get it and see, but Colby talks about the process to do this. Um, and he has a video on the like actual LinkedIn post, but it's amazing. So someone's like scrolling through on mobile and there's a video actually playing on the product listing where the image would usually be, uh, which is something I've actually never seen searching in the French Amazon, but is really, really astounding. So yeah, Amazon is getting getting very serious about video indeed. Uh, yeah, and actually this um, derma, plat, derma thing, this is the video for that. They have two videos on their listing, both of which I watched and found very educational. Uh, this is also video inside of SERP. So when you scroll through, this is from desktop, this showed up halfway down the page and is playing, of course, sound off, but you're probably seeing this a lot more in SERP these days if you're searching around. Usually it's at the top, sometimes in the middle, sometimes both. Um, so yet again, more video, pushing more pixels, more real estate on desktop and uh, mobile for Amazon. All right, now a bit of, a, a bit of an immediate shift because <laughs> I think this wouldn't be a presentation in early 2023 if I didn't say something about AI. Uh, everyone is talking about AI these days. I'm sure everyone here has heard a thing or two about it, but I have to wedge it in here somehow. And actually it is quite useful. So the way we've been using it at Pathfinder is uh, structure. It's really good for helping you like build out a structure of something uh, and then a rapid iteration of ideas. So you tell it refine, 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 and eventually you get to something that's really good. And then you yourself as the human will be the last gatekeeper modify it the way you want and put it up. I'll show you an example in a second. Basically what we do is we feed keywords and competitor content into the tool. And I'm talking about chat GPT here, but we've also used Jasper and another one called Barely, which I use on my desktop, which is pretty cool. Um, and you just tell the, tell the software to refine it, tell the AI to refine it. Make sure that you as the human have the final edit. Here's an example. Uh, this is basically, hey, AI, help me use, uh, you know, these, uh, bullet put these uh, bullet points here and create something that's funny and engaging and bullet points that I can um, use for my black food canister that I put on the counter. You know, something that's a fairly mundane product. And this is the stuff it came up with, you know, 
saying goodbye to stale cereal and soggy crackers. Our black canister will keep your snacks as fresh as the day you bought them. That's really good. I, I probably would have taken me a little while to come up with that. And this came back in like five seconds. So these are like clear benefits um, that have to do with like tidying up the kitchen, having your food be fresh. You're avoiding getting bugs in there. You don't want your co coffee tasting stale. And this is all pain points that we fed into this and then told the AI, hey, give us something clever we can use. And it's done that. I would still refine this a little bit, clean it up, but it is possible to get like 80% of the way there, which is actually astounding. Another one, uh, create a title. We just talked about titles for a while, but basically what I've done is uh, given it a bunch of keywords, given it some competitors, and then said, hey, could you make a 200 character title for this? Um, some of these AIs don't really understand character count super well, which is kind of funny considering uh, it's an AI, but you can shorten it down yourself or ask it to refine. You can say, hey, make it shorter, make it shorter. Eventually it'll cut it down to a more manageable length. Uh, and this is like, you know, almost ready for production. Farmhouse kitchen canister set, four piece carbon steel stainless canisters for coffee, tea, flour, sugar, blah, blah, blah. Pretty good. So that's AI. Uh, glad we could talk about that. And I do encourage everyone to use it. It's still in the experimental phase for us at Pathfinder. It's not like our main thing, but we love playing around with it um, as I think most people do. So here's the last part of this presentation, measuring results. We're gonna get a little bit technical here. So how do you know if your optimization has helped you unless you actually bother to measure it, right? The answer is uh, you actually don't. So you have to track it. You have no choice. <laughs> couple ways we do this. Um, this is the most simple version, but basically week on week changes. Um, take a spreadsheet, build it out in a way that you can understand it best, and then track your organic and your advertising results week to week. Um, the impact on your ads should be seen in the campaigns. You should be able to see your conversion rate uh, improving or increasing for the products that you've optimized in the subsequent weeks. Um, for organic or overall, you should be able to see that in unit session percentage, like I mentioned earlier, and hopefully session increases too. Uh, be aware, this is not perfect. Um, a lot of other factors are going to influence this. Uh, things out of your control, some things you know about, some things you don't. Let's go through like a short list. Uh, discounts or deals, you could say, hey, I'm not going to run any of those while I'm doing this test. I want to keep the results pure. Holidays and events, Prime Day, Easter, you can't help that. Those things are going to come up. Um, seasonality, my product is selling really well in winter, sells really poor in summer. Can't do anything about that, but you can keep yourself aware of it. Try to test within a period where it's all going to be, um, you know, the same. And then other things like competitors making changes to their listings, which of course you have no control over, but can at least try to remain aware of if you're plugged into that. So be aware there's noise in the data, but this is one imperfect, but I would say directionally useful way to track the changes that you've made. Now, if you want to get, oh, sorry, here, here's some more screenshots. <laughs> so yeah, here's uh, like an example we have. Uh, who says that spreadsheets have to be all just black and white? We make them nice and pretty. <laughs> um, but here we are like week prior, week number one, week number two. This is some data from late last year. But you can see sessions total. There's the BSR, conversion rate, order product sales. And we're just tracking it. Um, for this particular product, I think the conversion rate jumped a lot. But some of that might have been due to seasonality, actually, if you look at those dates and when, when they were. So be aware of that. Uh, oh yeah, for advertising, we use this too. Search term impression share is what STIS stands for. There is a report specifically for sponsored products that you can download and you can load that into a spreadsheet, have it filter into some cells, and that will tell you what your impression share is. That is to say, how many impressions you earned out of the potential impressions that existed in that given time period for your set of keywords. So basically what you're saying is, what's my market share of advertising? Um, and this is the other thing that we use to, to examine that. Now, if you wanna get really nerdy, you can do manage my experiments or manage your experiments is what Amazon calls it. This is a built-in feature that's freely available from inside of Seller Central. Um, and the main components here can be tested. So you got your product images, titles, bullet points, product description, and A+. You can test all five of those things. This is an actual A-B testing tool. This is, as I understand it, the thing that Amazon uses internally, and then they have since externalized for us uh, you know, sellers on the platform. And to, be, to have a real like A-B test, you technically need to test like one thing at a time. You can't change the title, the images, and the bullet points, and then say, okay, cool, uh, which one's better? You should just change the title run a test and then change the next thing, run a test. The only problem is um, it takes time. Uh, it used to be a minimum of four weeks for this to run. 
Uh, they've recently added a feature where once it gets enough data to reach what is basically a statistical significance, it will stop. Um, and you can tell it to automatically apply the results if you want. Not everyone wants to do that because uh, it gives Amazon a lot of license to do what they want with the listing. But this does require you have enough uh, sessions and sales on a daily, weekly basis to actually run this. Uh, but this works really well. We, we love using this for uh, primary images and titles, which is the first thing it was available for because we find that those have the biggest impact. And this is a test we ran at some point. Uh, yet again, everything blurred for uh, protecting the innocent here. But yeah, we found out that version A, which is actually the original title, was better than uh, the one that we were improving, version B. So hey, you know what? Sometimes we're wrong too. Now, Store Insights, this actually relates back to the storefronts and stores. This is the analytics platform that's attached to stores. And um, this has gotten so much better in the past, like I would say, year and a half. When it started, it was super basic. But this basically has uh, metrics that you can use to calculate conversion rate, specifically on pages. So when you're looking at um, analytics for a store, you want to see how individual pages are doing because those pages are landing pages or people come to them organically. And if some of them have a higher conversion rate, lower conversion rate, you can change the date range. It's customizable. And you can say this is the three weeks before. This is the three weeks after. Uh, how has the conversion rate changed based on the changes I've made to the store page? Um, so it is possible for you to track results that way. It's not perfect like the A-B test. It's a bit more uh, like the first one we used with the spreadsheets, but it is possible. Uh, yeah, that's all. <laughs> so I hope we have some time for a QA. and I, uh, I think that ran a little bit long, but hopefully it was enjoyable for everyone. And then the QR code, uh, you, you, they can scan it and then enter their email to just get the deck. Uh, we'll also be exactly. sharing they will also be sharing the recording separately as well. Yeah, um, then I'll kick you right through to it, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Brent, thanks so much. Lots, lots and lots of uh, different uh, considerations. Uh, super informative. There's already a few questions here, so I'm going to uh, read them aloud for the benefit of the rest of the audience, and you know, you can uh, you can react to those. So okay. question, question one from Jennifer. Uh, for the storefront, you mentioned use the same video from the landing page on the storefront. Can you clarify this? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, Jennifer, absolutely. So, so imagine this, you have a lot of options. Let's just take sponsored brands because that's one I'm maybe more familiar with. It's a little bit older. Um, you have a lot of options for creative choices with sponsored brands. You can use a lifestyle image or a product in use style image, a high quality render, whatever. Uh, as like your custom creative for a sponsored brand campaign. If you direct that campaign towards the storefront at a specific landing page, so you're saying, take this shopper from the SERP to my store page. If you have that same image somewhere in that same area where that person's landing, it creates like a link, right? So it's basically saying, oh, I saw this same image here and now I'm here and I see the same image here. It's like a synchronicity or kind of recipro reciprocity, I suppose the term is. So it's, it's a familiarity, right? They know that, oh, okay, I clicked this, I came to here. Some shoppers don't necessarily understand that when they, when they click an ad, they're gonna be taken to like an Amazon store page. Uh, not everyone is technologically competent as uh, most of us on this call probably are. And there's millions and millions of people shopping on Amazon. So this is like so, sort of a form of like reassurance almost. It's like, oh, okay, this is, you know, the expected behavior that I was kind of hoping would happen happened. I'm not on some strange place, like how'd I get here? Um, so we find that that is useful. Awesome. Um, by the way, the rest of the audience, again, this is the time for you to kind of base your questions in the Q&A. I know some of you are uh, sending us messages in chat. That's fine too. But if you can, just post your questions in the Q&A uh, section. Brent, uh, another one for you. Is it still best practice to use all caps at the start of each bullet point? Or is it back to sentence case? Yeah, I, I think you're not supposed to do that anymore. Yeah. Um, I spoke with Elena on my team, who I mentioned earlier in this call, who really helped me out with this prez. She did mention that um, two things that she sees a lot of listings do that are maybe not the best idea anymore is all caps for the first word, or sometimes all caps for the whole bullet point, which I definitely don't recommend, and emojis, um, emoji use inside of bullet points. I think those two things are generally disallowed on Amazon. Now, if you want to be a stickler, you could go real, read the uh, style guide, like I talked about in slide like 35 or whatever. 
that will tell you exactly <laughs> what you can and can't do. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen emojis or all caps listed in there. Now you might be able to get away with it. Amazon usually will scrutinize listings that are like top of their category and um, you know, modify or punish them and then like kind of make an example out of it. So, you know, not everyone on Amazon is going to be scrutinized all the time. So it might, it might work. Uh, but I think that that is technically disallowed. I think you're not supposed to do that. Another uh, fairly specific question here. If I am in the top 1% of sellers, would you say brand is important in the title? That's a great question. First of all, congratulations for being in the top 1%. <laughs> <laughs> um, and enjoy, your, enjoy your Lamborghini. Um, yeah, that's a great question because I think if you, if you have significant off Amazon brand awareness and you have some data to support the fact that people are searching for you by brand, like we have a few clients that people search for them by brand. We know because we have hundreds or thousands of dollars a month of ad spend for their brand terms, people are going to Amazon and searching for them, like for sure. If you look in brand analytics, um, that you know module inside of Seller Central, you can also see there are people searching for this term. If that's if that's the case, uh, your brand should probably be something you lead with and be proud of. Um, yeah, if you have a lot of off Amazon sales, you have a Shopify store and you have like a significant portion of your revenue, your business also from that, that's another good indicator that people know about you. Um, if you have a community that are like passionate, ardent followers of your brand and your products, that's probably another reason to put brand in the, in the front of the title. So I think there are a lot of reasons to do it. Um, the only other reason I can think of to not do it that's kind of interesting is there is something called a canonical URL, which is very interesting. So um, this is a, a bit unrelated and everyone like, please, please Google it later. But basically the, some of the first keywords that are in the title of your Amazon uh, product listing are what the actual URL ends up being for Google. So Google will then index those like four or five words. I think it is, I'm not an expert on this, but it's a consideration. Um, and essentially, if you have a if you have a, a, a brand in there that you're using one of those like four or five words that Google is going to index for your product uh, on brand, and, and is that valuable to you? Is another question. I don't I don't know the answer, but I think there is a case to be made in both in both directions. Yeah, uh, yeah, lo lots of questions coming here, Brent. <laughs> uh, one note for the audience: uh, I know we are. Uh, you know, close to time here. So in the event that we can't take your question, we'll make sure we respond to you, uh, you know, separately, perhaps in an email. What well, does that, does that work, Brent? I got time, yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> yeah. um, the, uh, so there's another question here and let's see, the, uh, is it okay to use all images in A plus content in terms of SEO optimization? Is it enough to just put keywords into images, alt text? Uh, uh, always have this issue of working on creatives. Uh, this is coming from Alexander Burkhart, uh, you know, so yeah, uh, go, go for it. I think, so the question if I understand is like, can you just use A plus content and then just make a bunch of images? Like, let's say you have gorgeous imagery is what you're talking about, Alexander, right? And you want people to see that in like full screen, as big as you possibly can, you know, shows up big on mobile and then not use any text and just use the alt text or the, you know, description text from it. Um, I don't, and it is a very visual storytelling medium that that might be acceptable in some cases. But my question is like, you can't even add like a couple bullet points to some description and some flavor text. I feel like that should be, that should be part of it. I, th I think there needs to be a little bit of each. Uh, I'm, I'm not totally convinced that only images would be the best way to go. Um, so I, I would say, I would say, yeah, try, try to find a balance between the two. I wouldn't encourage you to do just images. Um, I'm, I'm curious why the text is hard. It seems like the images would be like the thing that's usually hard. Um, the copy is usually easier just to write, but uh, yeah, the images you have to take with a real camera. <laughs> so it's tough. <laughs> I, I got a question for you, Brent. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the section on AI is super interesting and I've been messing around with chat GPT also. Uh, yeah. I've gone in there and said, hey, tell me who the competitors are and dropped an ASIN in there and does a pretty good job. Uh, you just tried different things. Um, and I think I also see the, the new AI kind of trend or the application, like for the longest time we have had AI working on like structured data, like uh, numbers and metrics. I think the new wave is AI around text, images, and video. 
Uh, mm-hmm. So the que- what the one question I have is like, if I'm a brand with a large portfolio, creating video content for all of my products is like insanely expensive. Mm. Uh, what do you do with that? Like, is this the is is the path still? Hey, pick your top X products and have videos for that, or do you think there is a path leveraging AI where there could be mass production of decent videos? You know, that's such a good question. Uh, that's a tough one, man. I mean, I know that there are AI AIs out there that can generate videos. I think there was one from Facebook that made the rounds a little while ago. That was very interesting. Yeah. Um, my other suggestion for people would actually be to use the Amazon uh, built-in like template template thing that you can build videos with. It's not nearly as sexy as using AI. And to answer your question directly, I do think there is uh, an opportunity for that. I'm not sure if the technology is there yet because like people's hands show up weird in AI videos and some of the cutting choices they might make are a bit strange, the pacing. And actually for that matter, they might be um, like disallowed by Amazon because they don't conform with some of the guidelines. But I think that the idea, the direction, directionally, the idea is there is really cool. Um, I would encourage people to look at the the video builder that's inside of Amazon. I mean, what we do at Pathfinder, we have a we have a team we work with. They're not in house, but they're really they're really close coordinating with us, and we have them like cut together client videos for us if they have footage and stuff like that. And that's more like boutique, one off, slower. So yeah, it's certainly not AI at scale. You know, three hundred products. But I would encourage um, brands and, and people in general to. Um, yeah, start with the products that already have the most traction with advertising that have the biggest opportunity and make videos for those, you know, start at the top. Don't just like randomly pick somewhere in your catalog to make a video. Yeah, because it is an investment of time and energy for sure. Totally. Question from Brendan Jones. Uh, do you think you get better results from having navigation images on the homepage of a brand store, like in the example you showed? Or do you think a product focused brand store homepage is also is a good idea? And I think he's saying that most of their sales come from uh, the homepage on the store and other pages yeah. trail pretty far behind. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the, the the answer to that, Brandon, is actually how large is your catalog? Like, do you feel a need to direct people to all the other areas um, where, where you have like product lines that are just that are significantly different or when you have a sponsored brand or a sponsored video, sponsored display video campaign, do you just send them right to the homepage? Because there might be a real use case for dropping them somewhere like that Gatorade thing. It's like, if they're just looking for a protein powder and the keywords indicate that, then you want to put them as close to the thing that they're aiming to buy as possible, right? You're trying to match intent with where they land. So if the homepage is like a smattering of like all different products, um, and that's working fine organically. You, you didn't distinguish if it was organic or ads, because I think there is a difference between the two. I think uh, the only reason to really sp- can, like split it out would be if you're going to do it by ads, because then people have to you know proactively navigate around, like you saw on the Gatorade page. They could do that from the drop downs, or they could just click you know go protein or whatever. Um, depends on the use case. Also, why not test it? <laughs> you can spin up a different version of the store. Uh, swap that out and then compare the data uh, and see what it looks like, you know, using the insights tool, which, like I said, is, you know, more useful than it used to be. It's not exactly like the best analytics ever, but you can look at the, you know, sessions and orders. You can calculate a conversion rate. They don't actually give it to you, which is a bit frustrating, but you can calculate it easily. Um, By the way, another quick request for the audience. Um, You know, we're going to take, I think, a few more questions here, but any feedback you have on today's session, you know, you know, just use the chat to you know, feel free to share uh, your perspective and opinions on today's session. That'll be super helpful. Um, one more question for you, Brent. Okay. What, what is your recommendation for face out images? Face out images? Yeah, I actually don't know what face out images are. Do you know? Face I- out. No, I don't know what that means actually. Face out images, not not phasing out, but fa- face out images. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess uh, we'll have to take that offline. Let me see what else. Uh, okay, yeah. Well, one thing I will say about images that's kind of interesting I picked up somewhere is if you have, imagine you're searching for that like dermabrasion thing we looked at earlier, that like that tool for the face. Um, and like you notice all the competitors have the tool in the picture facing like this way. 
like this way, this way, this way, this way. Make yours yeah. face the other way. <laughs> Just give a little like visual break in the page. So someone's scrolling and they're like, ah, oh, okay, that one's like going right instead of left. Um, yeah. So that, that doesn't answer the question, but it made me think of like, which way is it facing is an interesting question. Is it, is it facing right? Is it facing left? Yeah. Face out. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think Brent looks like that's it for uh, in terms of questions. Let, let me see actually. Oh, uh, I got a response back on what are face out images. I think they're referring to hero images and main images. I don't know if that changes the answer, but I think that's what they're referring to. Yeah, mm -hmm. face out images. I mean, the only other thing I can say about like, because I didn't specifically address it, uh, whoever's asking the question, I didn't I didn't talk about that at all, really, actually, because I think a lot of those common practices are, are like really, really well known. Like, you know, you need to have the white background, it needs to be the product, and there can't be like any other stuff in it that's not included um, yeah. with, with the packaging. Although what I see all the time and is a really good thing I think you should do actually, is imagine you have a, a socks, right? You're selling eight pairs of socks and your image is eight pairs of socks. Well, you might not include this in the package, but you, what you can do is put like a little tag in the bottom left corner that's maybe like stands out like a contrasting color of the main image this is. And it says like eight pieces or eight pairs. So the person, when they receive it, it's just in a poly bag or it's in a box or something, right? But when they're visually scanning the SERP, they see, oh, I'm looking for eight pairs of socks and this one has a little eight in the corner. And that tells me without ha me having to actually count how many pairs of socks there are here, uh, I can see it's eight because it says it's eight. Um, so that is something that uh, I think is is probably allowed by Amazon. They don't, they don't have any issue with that. And you see this a lot with like supplements and food where they have like the leaf, like a mint leaf. The, there's no mint leaf in the box, <laughs> but you get the idea that it's mint because there's a nice mint leaf there, like render it in and put next to it. Um, so that's that's another like common practice I like in main images I see a lot. Perfect. Well, I think uh, I think that's we probably call that a wrap here, uh, uh, Brent. I think that, that's all the questions we have. Okay, again, sounds good. Again, uh, the audience, uh, the contact information is on your screen. Feel free to reach out to Brent, follow him on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, again, thank you so much for the session, Brent. Sure, we will, sure. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, and we'll be sharing out the recording and the slide deck shortly. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of the week. And just FYI, Amazon's earnings are tomorrow, so we'll see what comes out of that. <laughs> yeah, I do read those. That's very interesting. <laughs> good point. Okay, thank you very much, Sunath and IntentWise crew. Thank you everyone for attending. Much appreciated. Have a yeah, good rest of your up. afternoon, evening morning, wherever you are. Bye.